Thank you, everyone, for joining us at this lovely 6 p.m. for this virtual fireside chat. Today, we're here to talk about what's all the fuss about Deepin. I think Deepin as a narrative has really caught on in the past few months, especially. It generally helps when the price goes up, <laughs> but Deepin's definitely here to stay. Um, today, I'm joined by, going in order, Ganesh from Covalin, Dermot from Pocket, John from Storage, Jasper from Seda, and Kanishk from Feek. I didn't mess that up. Let's go. All right, I'm going to let them do a round of self-intros first. So Ganesh, why don't you go first? Great stuff. Thanks. Uh, this is my second panel consecutively, so excited to be here. I'm the, one of the co-founders of Covalent. We're a data indexer, the largest data indexer uh, protocol. Specifically, DPIN uh, is the new kind of umbrella that we are categorized under. Uh, excited to dig deeper into the whole narrative. Hey everyone, so I'm Dermot, I'm one of the directors on the Pocket Network Foundation. Um, for those of you who don't know Pocket already, Pocket is a deep in that coordinates and incentivizes access to blockchains via a method known as RPC. And the difference with, RP with, with Pocket, I guess what makes it special is that we do this through a network of over 15,000 nodes distributed across 22 countries. And I guess it provides some unique benefits that I'm sure we'll get into as part of this panel. I'm John Gleason. I'm Chief Operating Officer for Storage. Storage is a decentralized cloud object storage provider. We're a drop-in replacement for Amazon S3, but we're built on a back end of over 23,000 nodes in 105 different countries, and we provide a service that's 80% lower cost, 80% lower carbon, but faster than Amazon globally from a single download. So that's what we do. I'm uh, Jasper. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Seta. We are building modular Oracle infrastructure, allowing any smart contract from any chain to query any data. Um, and I'm slightly confused by what DPIN is after talking to a lot of people here. It seems like the narrative is not completely clear yet of like the definition of uh, DPIN, so I'm excited to, uh, to dive in. Hey, everyone. I'm Kanishk. I'm the head of developer relations at Fleek. And I'm confused about DPIN as well. Because we got a bill. So yeah, Fleek is a decentralized infrastructure for pinning your files, for hosting your websites, for hosting your servers, basically everything. And we've got some amazing activities happening. And today, we're going to talk a little bit about how Fleet Network is scaling, and a little bit about the serverless edge playground that we have. But yeah, let's find out about Deepin. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, for full clarity, I'm also writing a Deepin report. I'm trying to come up with a new acronym. That sounds nice, but it's pretty hard. But I agree, Deepin's probably not the right word. Um, but since we're all confused about what Deepin is, for starters, what is Deepin and why does Deepin matter? I'll probably pick three of you. So Kanish, why don't you go first? Wow, that's pressure. <laughs> but yeah, Deepin, you know, decentralized physical infrastructure, that they basically refers to a distributed, a distributed system or a network where you can basically hold your data, hold your servers, hold your compute, basically anything. The greatest thing that I feel about Deepin is that it could be community run end to end, and that means ownership belongs to all of us. If I were to compare it to a centralized infrastructure, um, compare one of the biggest players in the world like AWS, if you don't pay your bill, you're kicked out. And that has happened to me in like a couple of times in my career. I forgot to pay the bill and I'm out. Well, when you run nodes on your own and when you have an infra that you are yourself supporting, the chances of that happening are very, very less. So it's community run, it's got empowerment, it's got ownership. And I would say that that is one of the narratives of Deepin that I love. And of course, we sort of started chasing performance and scalability at Fleek. And when we started doing that, we just realized, wow, doing it in the decentral way or doing it in the distributed way is the best way to move forward. And that's what I feel. And you know, now over to everybody here. Yeah, so how I understand Deepin is basically using crypto economic incentives to give people permissionless access to infrastructure. Um, but I think that that is such a broad uh, sort of like definition that can be applied to almost all of crypto. So I'm, so I'm kind of curious what narrows it down for, for the rest of the panel. Go, go for it, Dermot. I, I love that we're all fighting over that, the definition. Um, it is a, a muddy term somewhat, but for me, a deep in is simply a network that coordinates and incentivizes physical infrastructure to power digital services. And I, guess, I think the most interesting thing about Deepin is actually 
those digital services are usually existing services provided by centralized entities. And DPINs can actually power these digital services in ways that are much better and much stronger on some vital dimensions. And for me, I think the commonalities across all DPINs uh, in terms of the major benefits are twofold. So the cost benefits, actually having a protocol and a blockchain acting as a single source of truth that can efficiently and effectively match supply with demand is incredibly efficient and it can just drive down the costs. Um, you're massively reducing the, the coordination overhead and that kind of audit burden. Secondly, the scale. We can actually, through these incentives and coordination methods, we can pull in existing infrastructure and through these market signals as demand increases, we can simply tap into that infrastructure to scale up as demand scales also. And similarly, because ultimately tapping into new services or markets is a coordination game, we should be able to do this theoretically much quicker and faster and more scalably than a, a traditional company could by doing all on its own. So that, 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 that are the two for me, cost and scale. But. Uh, the way I think about it is, uh, is in contrast with a network like Uber. So in any kind of supply demand uh, network, there's a capital outlay that is pushed onto the supply side that services the incoming demand. But what's unique about Deepin, I think people get confused with the, the P, which is the physical, because it's all computers at the end of the day. So what's physical about this is basically the alignment between the different actors. When the supply side and the demand side in an Uber network does the matchmaking, the people who actually accrue value are the shareholders of the Uber network and neither the riders nor the drivers. So I think that's where there's misalignment of, of values, misalignment of uh, you know, uh, accrual. And with a deep in, if you introduce a token, essentially uh, it compresses or projects down uh, the value accrual mechanism and leads to better incentives and growth in the network. Uh, and that's like the primary driver. There's other benefits with you know, uh, removing busy work, uh, reducing the friction of coordination and so on. But that's not specific to Deepin. But the primary thing, in my opinion, is uh, the token incentives and reducing the number of actors rather than adding an economic rent seeker who are the shareholders who are doing nothing but just holding Uber stock. You know, I'll add one other layer to that, which is, you know, I, I think when you look at the distributed nature of um, what we can do with Deepin, it's actually the first disruptive approach to web through tech. And I think you made the point earlier in your last panel that web through tech is pretty good, right? And all the flavors of things that have come along to disrupt Amazon have been me too infrastructure, me too architectures, right? They're just trying to do the same thing, smaller scale, but cheaper. But when you look at um, what Airbnb did to the hotel industry, what uh, Rideshare did to the rental car and taxi industries, right? This is what Deepin can do to web two tech. Right, by tapping into all of this distributed, underutilized infrastructure all around the world. Distributed architectures can be faster. They're by definition going to be cheaper. And they can also be you know, friendlier to the environment. And so there's really an inherent advantage in the architecture where it can be truly disruptive. And I think when you look at Deepin across the board, you know, a lot of the themes that you're hearing here are that it's simply fundamentally a better architectural approach. And that's where we're seeing all this interest in that disruption. Yeah, I definitely agree on that point. As far as the next question, I think a few of you have already touched on this briefly, but I really wanted to dive in. What are the structural advantages of Deepin that make them superior to sort of these Web2 resource or infrastructure networks? But John, you want to go first? Yeah, I'll go first. You know, in, for us, really, there's a couple of structural advantages. The first one is uh, distributed systems, when you can sort of tap into a lot of storage across a lot of different infrastructure, you can get a huge amount of throughput and a huge amount of performance, right? And so there's a big lift there. Um, other inherent advantages just happen to be around the security aspects, right? Because when you have to build an application on top of infrastructure that you don't own or control, you have to do different things with your security. And that infrastructure layer that you build with zero trust, zero knowledge, so that you can secure, in our case, data storage, that whole infrastructure becomes a feature. It becomes a security benefit for people who are building applications on that. And those are some of the, the, the sort of fundamental things where we see. I don't know who wants to maybe chime in next. Yeah, sure. Uh, just to layer on top of that, I guess, to add on to the benefits already mentioned and what I also mentioned earlier, I guess, I think a really interesting one for me is actually decentralized demand. I think when 
Airbnb and Uber launched, this is kind of seen as the rise of these new power organizations and decentralizing the supply side clearly had these major cost and scale benefits. But both Airbnb and Uber in their IPO prospectuses talked about how they wanted to give ownership to their supply side, but weren't able to. So we're able to do this now with using blockchains. And the second piece is, imagine Airbnb and Uber as a protocol. I know there's been some really bad blockchain ideas trying to think about this, but actually we're being really realistic in terms of thinking about the digital services Deepin can service. But by having multiple apps or multiple interfaces to the same underlying infrastructure, it's much more likely and easier to scale to more markets, more niche use cases, and ultimately provide customers with a much better end user service. Um, because ultimately, competition is one click away, but you're also kind of collaborating on the same underlying infrastructure. So that, I think that's a major benefit. In my opinion, there's three key points that makes the architecture here so interesting. The first is the technical difference uh, with a network like Uber and uh, a deep end project like Covalent which is the use of the blockchain. So the coordination mechanism is on the blockchain. So it's all transparent. The second thing is the economics. In the economics, what happens is, uh, the point I mentioned before is with the shareholders being the economic rent seekers, essentially not, not really contributing value to this network. So here, it's the supply and the demand directly transact with each other using the blockchain as that substrate. And the third is the governance. Who governs the Uber network? or who governs the Airbnb network. It's the shareholders, the board of directors, which is completely a waste of uh, talent. Here, it's the people self-governing. I think that's a very unique aspect. And uh, maybe for the first time in uh, society, uh, you are able to govern structures at scale. We've always had co-ops, we've always had uh, municipal self-governing institutions, but having two random people being able to transact, being able to govern, a system that is uh, serving their own benefits is uh, maybe for the first time in society that we're able to see. Gotcha, yeah. So programmer grow equity, but don't tell Gary Gensler I say that. <laughs> Obviously, one component of building out Deepin is both incentivizing the supply side and the demand side. And it's kind of like a chicken and egg thing. And I think token or crypto economic incentives play a really large role in us being able to do that much faster at a much larger scale than traditional Web2 companies. So for you guys, how do you guys think about token incentives and the role it plays when, when building out these networks? You wanna give it to Jasper first? Yeah, I think, I think they're everything. I think like one of the cool things about Deepin is sort of like how you can create like a hyper-competitive market by freeing it up to everybody, right? Like that's where a lot of the, because you remove these rent-seeking middlemen. And I think that the freedom to program money flows, which is essentially what we're all doing on a day-to-day -day basis if you're working in crypto, uh, just allows you a lot of freedom for experimentation and allows you to do things that have never been done before and iterate quickly and come up with new ways to incentivize mm, participants on both sides of the stacks and create like dynamic sort of like levers that you can lever where if some part of the stack is lacking, you can like turn on the throttle there a bit more. I think. Yeah, I think sort of like the, just the programmability of tokens and money is cool. Um, and yeah, it's a... Um, yeah, just to add on to that, you know, recently crypto incentives, token incentives have been the norm for the longest time. But I've seen a very major shift now to points as well. Did anybody catch that hype recently with the points becoming the biggest thing in the industry? So now the way we saw it was, you did, right? <laughs> so and the way it sort enjoyer. of structured out <laughs> was that um, you know, points and token incentives in general allow you to build multi-layered community incentivization models, which means that you can build a funnel. People coming in for the first time to your network will get this percentage. People coming in the next time will get this percentage. And you can keep incentivizing people who keep contributing. And therefore, I believe that you know, obviously token incentive models are there. But as you, as and when you dive deeper into the funnel for it and you study it out, it's amazing. And I think um, we've seen 100 implementations of it. None, none is the best, none is the worst. It's just the way you execute this. That's what matters. Yeah, I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into token centers. I think you've seen examples such as Helium where they've emitted 
way too many tokens at the start. But then there's probably other examples of other DeFin that they just did not emit enough tokens in order to sort of kickstart that famous DeFin flywheel. How do you guys think about approaching sort of designing the token incentives, whether that's like a quantitative approach, a qualitative approach, or what type of strategy you guys have in mind when thinking about this? I think one thing we see in, uh, in DeFin is that all of us at one point in time wondered if we were supply constrained and all of us find out that we are demand constrained, right? There is an ab absolute enormous amount of unused storage capacity for us, unused infrastructure capacity out there, just waiting to be tapped into. But finding people who will pay to use it is a different thing altogether. And so if you design an incentive structure around the idea that what you need to do is incentivize supply, you get crushed. Like you just get robbed blind because that's the wrong thing to do. And everybody learns that lesson. And then it's really about tuning a balance between supply and demand. Too much supply, not enough demand, too many riders, too not enough drivers, right? It's, it's that conundrum that we all have. And so building that credibility and, and finding that, that demand side is always the key. And one of the interesting things that, that we've also found is that the innovation is, is in Web3, right? All, all of the cool things going on, the technology uh, advantages are here, but the demand is in Web2. And so bringing the Web2 revenue in is really what's going to balance that supply and demand side. And that's why we're so heavily focused on pulling in revenue from real companies storing real data. And I think that's a, a trend you see in DPIN especially is bringing Web2 demand into Web3. Um, yeah, it's a great question. I guess, I think with Pocket, I think for people who follow the history of Pocket, Pocket over incentivized the supply side and I guess Thinking back to, I guess, my mental model for the best way to think about this, I think a slow start is actually really important to actually, and I think that this is actually the opposite parts of the economic side, but actually it's making sure you build up the cultural ties between your existing community. So that means when people do come into your community, they actually stay and understanding your, your mission, vision, values, and your culture. But then I guess the second piece is also understanding how much supply side you need because you kind of know, you need to tailor that to the level of demand, as you're saying. There's no point needing a thousand x more infrastructure than you have demand for. So I think that's really important to kind of run these experiments and ultimately to rein it back once it goes too far. But um, I guess one other thing to say on incentives, while I think incentives and the token side are fantastic for bootstrapping and overcoming the cold start problem on the supply side, on the flip side, on the demand side, end users care about reliability, performance, and cost. It's not about token incentives. So I think that's really interesting as we look to bootstrap demand because that is the biggest problem in crypto right now and yeah I think that pocket we've got a really interesting idea about this but our deep in mullet strategy but um, I'd love to hear more from others about how they're thinking about demand as well it's more or less the same points here so at covalent we've uh, taken a very structured approach to bootstrapping the network I think the demand side cannot be subsidized because demand side uh, the demand curves are asymmetric in the sense that just because something is cheaper, uh, people are not willing to accept lower performing tools, but people will pay more for higher performance. So that's asymmetric. So the harder point here is to bootstrap the demand. And if you bootstrap the demand, supply comes automatically. It's, uh, it's a no brainer. So in the covalent, covalent network for the last two years, we've only had 15 operators who've served the supply side. And we scaled out the demand side through hackathons and other kinds of developer outreach and blew it out to thousands of applications. And now we're starting to scale out the supply side. But the cool thing here is that the token incentives on the supply side uh, don't have to be hyperinflative because you have an exogenous source of capital, which is the demand side revenue helping bootstrap the supply side. So the economics and the market plays dynamics just takes care of that uh, balance automatically. And token incentives actually kind of contort the supply demand economics. Yeah, I would definitely agree there. I think if I were to build a DFIN, you should not be incentivizing demand side at all because that's the only way you're able to see that you have true product market fit for your product or your resource network. I wanted to um, follow on on something that you brought up, Dermot. I think there's a lot of DFIN projects out there that say, hey, our storage, our decentralized compute, our whatever is 10 times cheaper than the Web2 alternative, AWS, Dropbox, whatever. But 
if it's so obvious, why isn't that demand side there? You mentioned a few other factors, but I'd love for our others to chime in here. Why has that demand side, given the obvious benefits, not shown up yet? I think it's quite simple. The product sucks, so it's not competitive from a Web2 marketplace. Web2 products are really, really good. They get your five nines. You're able to get the SLAs. And the product delivery is not just a technical delivery. It's the after-sales support. It's the enterprise contracts. It's having uh, business insurance. There's a lot more that goes into a product than just the technical delivery. I think the space today is still in the technical realm with technical founders trying to solve problems with technical solutions, which is only a part of publishing a, a product. The products, quite frankly, suck. So products have to improve uh, to be competitive from an economic market. So back to my thing, these demand curves are not, as they're asymmetric. Just because it's lower quality, people are not willing to pay a lower cost. They actually pay zero revenue, and they would pay a premium for premium products. Yeah, I'll, I'll just be quick, but um, yeah, reliability and performance come first. And once you get to that level, cost comes next. And I think you make a great point. To build out the technology, to build out a community, to build out this decentralized infrastructure is incredibly hard. And then to expect that same team to be a world-class sales team, customer support team, it's a really massive ask and also quite unlikely that they could do it all themselves. And so for Pocket, that realization came, got to mainnet. We've done this really hard thing. We built the first decentralized RPC. Oh, where are the users? Okay, they don't want to connect directly to the protocol. Turns out people pay for convenience. So we built our first gateway, which abstracts away the protocol, and then demand starts to kick in. But then we realized having one gateway trying to scale to all the markets in the world, all the regions, all the languages, all the developer markets, that's really, really tough. So our big change in our strategy over the last uh, 12 months is actually realizing that the protocol's core customers are these businesses, not the end users. So we're now opening up our infrastructure to make it really easy for any business existing or startup to tap into Pocket's infrastructure and then resell it. And I think that's how we scale to all the markets and regions across the world. It's, there's, I think there's no chance that one team can do it all. So that's how we're thinking about it. And to Ganesh's point, then these end users and kind of these gateways, these are ultimately centralized entities that can build on these value add features, provide customer support, do that kind of BD and marketing that a decentralized team can't really do. Yeah, I think we're seeing a lot of the same things where the product has to be good, right? It has to be compatible, it has to be easy to use, an enterprise is not going to hire a team of 14 people to go figure out a new protocol, rewrite all their applications, just to store something on because it's decentralized. Right? They're going to look for the easy button. They're going to go, can I save money? Yes. Is it fast, fast enough or faster than what I'm using today? Yes. Is it secure? Can I trust it? Can it meet my compliance requirements? I'm going to run you through a ringer. And if you can get through all of these hoops, then I'll give you money. And I would say that uh, DPEN is probably the one area where because of the advantages, you're actually seeing Web 2 growth coming into Web 3. I mean, we're seeing IBM money, money that used to get paid to get IBM, is now being paid to us. Amazon money getting paid to us, right? Our monthly growth rate, roughly 20% month over month, 90% of that is Web 2. So when you find that product market fit, right, you can, you can be disruptive and you can win, but oh my gosh, is it hard to get there. Yeah, I think for us, we're in a little bit of a different boat because we don't really sell to Web2 companies. We sell to smart contract protocols. So I think that for us, the trade-off of like, hey, maybe it's a bit shittier to use than a centralized alternative <clears throat> doesn't really, doesn't, it's not really something we run into. Um, mainly because there's a reason why these people are building uh, smart contract tech. And if they would build it on top of a centralized like data network, then they forego most of the benefits of building a smart contract infrastructure in the first place. So it, it's not something we struggle with directly so much. And we are actually, yeah, our demand side's looking pretty good um, in, in crypto. But we sell to crypto. So it's a, yeah, we, we don't have the sort of like uphill battle that you guys are, uh, are facing. Yeah, I'm afraid we're on that battle because we try to serve all kinds of users and we feel that if performance is what we sell and if scalability is our virtue, then we can never differentiate between Web 2 and Web 3. 
we have to make things good enough so that we can stand against Web2 and say, hey, we work. And that's it. So in that journey, we felt that having private data is also a big thing that Web2 has. Take any big, big company, for example, you know, take the big four. If you go to them and you say, hey, use our infra, the first question they'll ask is, OK, is my data going to stay privately safe with you? And the answer is no. Because a lot of deep end projects are built on public protocols, right? IPFS being one of the biggest ones. So therefore, you need to build solutions that actually safeguard that private data and don't openly distribute it to everybody who should not have access to it. And we were able to build out a solution for that in the Fleek network ecosystem. And we were just talking about fully have a homomorphic uh, encryption as well in the morning with the team, seeing how we can maybe work that out. And we've also got Intel SGX chips that can sort of help us scale that forward and actually build a solution that gives you a safe housing for all the private data that you may need. And in this, exploring ZK is a big part. So you can only build a scalable and a truly decentralized solution to infra. And that's what we believe and that's what we're trying to achieve. If you don't just put yourself on the nodal level, but actually on the math level and try to find ways to safeguard data. Because at the end of it, data is oil. That is what sells, that is what runs the world. And if you publicly expose all of it, that might not be the best thing for a lot of products. So you need to find that fit and you need to sell accordingly. And that's where, you know, if the product sucks, if the product sucks, that I, I'll just take that definition to say if a product is not fitting a company, then it sucks. And there can be a hundred definitions to that then. So that's what I would say. Yeah, I think one trend that I've noticed in the past few months is that a lot of deep in projects going, okay, maybe B2C is in the way, B2B might be the way forward, because as a consumer, I'm not thinking about storing my holiday photos on Filecoin. Like, that, let's be honest there. I think I'm going a bit off the script here, but I want to ask a slightly cynical question, right? You mentioned that for a lot of sort of these infrastructure companies out there, you want like service level agreements, you want insurance, you want customer support, you want like this whole host of like sort of orthogonal like benefits, but it's also very crucial to like the resource and the quality of the resource being delivered, right? How do you guys think the long term sort of governance structure or even like corporate structure of Deepin looks like knowing that you kind of need to have these centralized interface which manage all of these different functions? Like what do you think that end game looks like? given the whole point of it is like decentralized and you know there's like token it's held by members of the community etc cetera, etc cetera. it's a great question and i think we already have the playbook here this is open source companies commercializing their technology one of the big trends over the last uh 15 years is um these hosted open source piece of software this would be MongoDB, where the database is open source, but you have MongoDB, the company, which is a public company. Elasticsearch, um, Confluent, and Kafka started an open source project, and uh, they're all public companies now. So the governance always is at tension with the community needs. There's no clear answer, because on the commercial side, it's about KPIs, it's about revenue, it's about revenue growth, and it's not necessarily in the best interest of the stewards of the open source protocol. I think uh, crypto is different because I would say almost it's like an evolution on uh, open source where it's not just open source software, but it's a live and thriving network. And so the governance is owned by the, or controlled by the token holders, which may or may not be uh, the, the users with the revenue and the demand side. So for the best of the protocol, I think it's important that the founding team decentralizes this in a responsible manner and actually gives up control early on. I mean, there's an appropriate time for this. So if you, if you control this too much, then all the revenue goes through a single gateway or a single centralized company. And uh, ultimately, you know, it kind of inhibits the growth of that protocol. But uh, I think open source gives you that answer. You look at every single open source protocol today, they have a business source license. It's not truly open source, so you need to have commercial license if you want to use it. That's mostly because uh, MongoDB and Elasticsearch, Amazon comes in like a, like a parasite and just hosts your software, and they're at odds, and it's, a, it's just a big mess. So it's not just the consumers and the companies that are sponsoring open source, but it's also other these hyperscalers coming in and ripping you off. So I think it's a pretty complicated kind of system, and uh, I don't think there's a clear-cut answer today. Yeah, at Pocket, we actually believe we're pioneering a model that we hope others to copy from, and it's got a couple of core principles as part of it, and I guess the main one being 
anyone should be able to buy your economics, but you have to earn your governance. And so as part of our new system, which is built on verifiable credentials, we're representing all of our builders, which includes technical builders and non-technical builders, you know, contributing to governance and things that matter. Um, and really the frame there is impact. But on the second side, it's the core users of the protocol. So of course you have your supply side. For us, that's those running infrastructure for all of the data sources that we, we um, ultimately support. And on the second side is our gateways, those send sending demands to the protocol. Um, they should have representation, and that's what we're looking to give them. So I guess where this all ends up, if I th over time, if we succeed in doing what we're doing, if these gateways essentially offload all of their backend infrastructure to our protocol, they'll want to have a say in how it evolves, how it upgrades, how it moves. So it's a delicate dance for sure, but we're starting small, giving people a say, making sure we build up the right culture of collaboration, being as transparent as possible. But ideally, we do move to this new future where the protocol is ultimately owned and governed by its users and all of the key digital platforms are. And I guess the key part of that is you do not want to let plutocracy take over. Because I think for sure, if you just have a token that represents all of your governance, that makes things really difficult. So, and you're seeing more and more themes think about, okay, what actual um, activities drive impact? Who are the key stakeholders? How should they be represented? I think. That'll be unique to everyone's protocol, but I think it's a really important frame for all of us to think about. Otherwise, as you said, this won't be sustainable at scale. I think the, uh, the open source aspect of it is really uh, very critical, but also you have this, this whole ecosystem, right, with the independent operators who are running the infrastructure underlying your node. And so when you take that, that open source software and you know, the, the, the base protocol operators go and blaze a trail and show that you can actually build an economically viable system, that it is rewarding to participate in that cloud ecosystem, and you actually enable uh, people with a single computer or a single data center to compete in a way that's different and participate in the cloud economy, it kind of, it builds that, that system that is defensible and is kind of a moat that won't let you get disrupted by just somebody taking your open source code and using it as a loss leader to sell Web2 infrastructure. But now you have built this open source system, you've proven a model that you can build a viable service on it and make money and run a company, and you have this network effect of thousands of people in your community. That opens up a whole new system for other people to then build value in that ecosystem. And I think that's gonna be the, the way that, that this evolves is it's just, it starts with the project, right? It proves the model, it builds the channel, and then from there, really, that's how you get to hyperscale. Gotcha. Um, as a reminder, we are having a Q&A segment in roughly 10 minutes or so. So if you have any spicy, deep in hot takes or questions, get them prepared. I think there's two more questions I want to ask. The first one is, I'm banking on the question I wanted to ask. <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to move on to the last question I was going to ask and come back to the second last one. In your mind, uh, I remember it. What are some of the largest challenges you have faced in building out your deep end project, like the ones where you thought it was going to be a breeze, and then like six mi months into the grind, you went like, "Holy shit, this is hard," and this is not what I expected at all. Well, I think we're all <clears throat> listen. We're not making it easier for ourselves by building this stuff on distributed networks. Let me say that first. I think for a lot of people in Web two, when you tell them what you do, it sounds like something that shouldn't be that big of a project. You know, And I think that a lot of people coming into the space make this mistake where they're like, hey, decentralized Uber sounds great, right? Like, uh, cut out the middleman. And then, uh, yeah, it's, it's just, I, I think for us, it's like the economics. It's just, it's just really, really difficult to nail the economics. And it takes a lot of trial and error and modeling and going back on it and like admitting you're wrong. And uh, I think what Dermot said makes a lot of sense. It's like the start with sort of like low emissions and see what happens. And then if you need to increase, increase. Because if you start high and you go low, you die. Like it's, that, that's, that's just not a, not a good idea. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, you start high and you go low. We've, that's not a story new to any of us. We've seen a hundred tokens that have gone through that route. You've seen 100 graphs that have go, go, gone through that route. But I think for us, um, at the core of it, yes, we are in Web3. Yes, we want to build decentrally. Yes, we want to do all these amazing things. But at the core of it, we're building a business, right? And the way your business is viable, if it's pulling in money, 
or if people are using you, and you can find a way to incentivize it, right? So, um, you know, decentralized Uber, yes, amazing. And the only actual implementation that I saw of it wa was in India. So I went to India and I saw a, a brand called InDrive. I'm giving them a shout out because I loved it. And what it is, it's actually a network of taxis that's actually computing everything. It's all decentralized. And the way you actually connect to a taxi is if you have that app. So your phone is running a server, the taxi is running a server, and you connect to it. I thought that was brilliant. So when we started building Fleek, obviously we knew it's never going to be easy. But one big component for us was talking to people. So our customer support our, uh, and our community angle was always at the core and the heart of us. And every time we ship something, we asked people, hey, did you like it? And we were open to all kinds of abuses thrown at our way. We were open to all sorts of you know, um, shit posting on Twitter, memes on our Discord, roast us all you like. One thing that we know is we could build it out. And you know, as a team, we focused a lot on what people would actually use. We don't want to build a decentralized Tinder. right? We've seen that project in almost every hackathon we've gone to. It sounds amazing. It's so much fun. Oh, you can see everybody's likes and who's matching and who's not. But it's a terrible business. And the only way you find that out is if you talk to people, if you find that PMF, the product market fit. And slowly, it's a very slow and a very tenuous cycle, but you sort of get there. So if, as a product, you're not talking to the people who actually use you, you'll, you are NGMI. You're not going to make it at all. And yeah, that's what I would say. I don't know, man. Getting paid to get rejected by girls on Tinder sounds not bad, to be honest. But uh, John, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think. Uh, Building a service, uh, you know, is hard enough. Building it in a data center that you own and control, but building that same service in the most hostile environment on the internet, where your own infrastructure can attack you, is probably the the most complicated thing. And then when you finally get that thing running and it's humming like a top, and you take it to a customer, and they go, "No, that's not it." Like that iterative process of talking to customers, getting that feedback, finding that product market fit. Once you've achieved the impossible of building your service on a decentralized network, then making it attractive to a customer, I think it's that second leap that's so hard. But then once you get there, right, then you're no longer building the Rube Goldberg way of solving an already solved problem. You're actually providing a differentiated solution. But it's that last leap of really getting the customer and finding that fit, that's, that's been the, the hardest part and the most satisfying part at the same time. Yeah, I think Pockets made a lot of mistakes along the way, so uh, we've got a lot of learnings, and thankfully we're still here to tell the story. Um, I think the technology is obviously incredibly hard, as you're saying, to centralize infrastructure, and you succeed, you get to mainnet, and then where are the users? So making that usable is incredibly difficult. I think the second part related to the technology is um, understanding where your real USP is, because I think um, in this space that we're all in, everyone gets very excited about the technology of oh, what consensus are you on, all of these kind of fun different features, but actually the users don't care. And that's been a big learning for Pocket of actually it's our utility that matters, and all we need to do is focus on that. So we're moving to a more modular stack to focus on our utility and going away from some of the sexier sounding tech, but I think that's really helpful for us building and focusing on our USP. Um, economics is obvious, when to rein in, um, how much incentives you need to bootstrap your supply side, and um, I, I guess the other part, which is we kind of touched upon with governance, but um, I think we've done a lot of good things in our governance of Pocket, but it's still really, really hard to have a decentralized community around the world to get all these people, anons and some people docs, to work together productively and feel re represented and uh, kind of all aligned. That's a real working problem, right? Um, so yeah, I, th I think these are some of the, the bigger problems at least we've faced, and we're not there yet, but we're making some progress for sure. I think it's all hard, right? So think about the, the ideation in the market. What kind of customer persona? You could make mistakes there. The financing, you sell too much of the network that leads to centralization risk. Then you don't do your financing the right way. That leads to you know, regulatory risk. Then you go in and uh, you have like governance risk. Then you have actual product technical risk. Then it's all risks all bundled together. So I think uh, the other big issue is managing your financial risk because these crypto cycles are four year cycles and if you don't raise enough money, you can make the distance and your token prices are not enough to do a token sale. So most projects unfortunately died last year or are in a zombie mode when bear markets is a time to invest heavily in that for the next wave. So 
I think it's all risks, and I think um, I don't think there's a right mistake and a wrong mistake. Just don't repeat the mistakes, right? Gotcha. All right, last question before the Q and A segment. From your view, what would a deep in dystopia look like? The wildest dreams, blockchain takes over the world. What would you like deep in? Like, what type of role would you like deep in play in society? Or how would you envision how much deep in has sort of permeated to society? It's a tough question. Um, I, I can start if no one wants to. Yeah, I think from my view, in the end state of deep in, in my wildest dream, every resource network is. A, decentralized, B, minimize rent extraction, and B, uh, sort of community owned, even though that's kind of overlapped with the first, but I think there's like a little bit of not overlap too. I think that rent extraction is probably the most important, or like the lack of rent extraction, and in, in the dream world, right, all of these resource networks should look a lot more like public goods than like $40 billion companies trading on the New York Stock Exchange that are extracting every single last dollar from both the demand side and the supply side. I think one of the most exciting things about crypto is uh, it opens up opportunities. And so if your crypto economics and your governance process is set up right, then all of the geographical barriers just goes away. Anyone can come participate, they can earn tokens. I think it's an, just an open economic environment. I think that's like utopia. Yeah, I guess um, it's a great question. I think definitely the big picture is that all of the world's most important digital uh, infrastructure are owned and governed by their users. But to your point, those users are largely B2B. So I think for the end users, the consumers, I think the benefit for them is that they actually have a business that's tailored to their interests, their market, their region, their languages. And they can easily flip and switch to any other provider very easily. It's all using the same underlying infrastructure. So I'm thinking more competition, lower costs, much more tailored uh, features for um, these particular end users. But yeah, much better value add um, approach all around. So yeah, I guess ultimately massive consumer surplus at the end of this is how I'm thinking about it. One of the things that I, I see is sort of the, the vision for Web3 is when projects start to integrate really well together and deliver solutions. So you don't just have a whole bunch of point solutions that you need to stitch together, but you have end-to-end -end things that solve real problems for people in a distributed and decentralized way. My favorite example is uh, LivePeer. So LivePeer and Storage together give you a complete end-to-end -end solution for everything you need from live streaming to VOD, right? It's great, and it's all decentralized backend. It's a, it's a full solution. And there are tons of those examples that are going to start to emerge over the next few years. And I think as we see that adoption and we see that growth and we see those real world problems being solved, that's utopia for me. Yeah, I was just talking about that, that actually. I think that indeed the composability of like these open networks is really, really interesting. And I think the, um, yeah, the permissionless nature allowing anybody from anywhere to interact with them, but also them interacting with each other is what gets me most excited. And I think that if you create like this super strong like symbiosis of like um, deep in projects, at some point you're not going to need centralized counterparties anymore, because it creates such a strong moat for a service that it's just going to spawn businesses reselling that service for you instead of like three competitors essentially building the same thing but just making it a BD or a sales game, and as a result the technology just moves forward way slower. That's, that's, that's utopian. Uh, talking about the utopian or dystopian vision of Deepin, I'm, I'm going to take you back a couple of years. How many of you have heard about uTorrent? uTorrent, BitTorrent, you know, peer-to-peer -peer data delivery networks. How many of us have downloaded pirated games on it? GTA San Andreas, baby, all the way. Now, the reason I bring that up is because while peer-to-peer -peer data delivery, what uTorrent did was revolutionary, right? With it, you could basically share whatever you want, wherever you want, however you want. All you need is at least one computer in that particular network acting as a node. What did people use it for? Pirating games, pirating movies, all of that stuff. Now, of course, good stuff also came out of it, right? Tokens like gated things got out to public and people could actually share data openly. But I think we walk a very you know, difficult line when we say that everything has to be properly decentralized for this infra to work. Because while there are always going to be good actors in the ecosystem, 
you can never get rid of the bad actors who will spoil the name, who will sort of get in the way of that true utopian vision. So I would say that one of the easiest way to move forward would be to just, you know, again, keep a check. Yeah, you don't have to control, but keep a check because with you, there are, there's a community with you when you run deep in, right? Or when you are a part of a deep in or like an infra. And you can just let your community know when you are worried about something. And I'm sure people will share that interest or that worry with you. And that would be a very nice way to guide you through. So whether we get to utopia or dystopia, I would say that modularity is the virtue, composability is the virtue, but every ecosystem sort of decides it's for itself. With say uTorrent, we've got both. But with Web3, again, we've got both. So now it's up to us and up to the community on how we got to lead it and how we got to make it through. All right, thank you all. Now for our Q&A segment. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll probably run over to you with the microphone. Any takers? First come, first serve. You, you look like you have a question. All right, you're the man. Um, this is for, for John. Um, you mentioned a, a few times that um, deep end infrastructure could be more environmentally friendly. And uh, is this because uh, deep end is better at um, resource allocation? And could you expand upon this and whether this could be used as a selling point for users or like um, infrastructure providers? Yeah, so from our point of view, what we do is we sort of act as the Airbnb for hard drives. So we find data centers, individuals, businesses all over the world that have hard drives that are already being spun, powered, and cooled, and we tap into that, and it doesn't take any more energy to fill a drive up three quarters than it does to have a drive one quarter full. And one of the, uh, the things that we did earlier, uh, actually late last year and finished earlier this year, was uh, we did an analysis of where is the carbon footprint in cloud storage? And as it turns out, about 60% of the impact is from the manufacturer of the drive. So when you go to an Amazon, you add new capacity, and they build new data centers, and they buy hard drives and servers and rack all that equipment specifically for customers, that has a huge carbon impact up front. And what we're doing is we're taking an investment that's already been made, and we're extending the service life of those drives. We're tapping into drives that are already being run, and the, the overall net impact is that it reduces the carbon footprint for cloud storage by about 80% compared to Amazon. So that's where that analysis comes in. And you can actually find our white paper on our website if you really want to dive into the numbers. All right, any other takers for questions? How do you bootstrap something like longevity of a protocol within a deep end? Uh, this is a panel to all, uh, this is a question to everybody on the panel. Um, also, thank you so much, uh, this has been amazing. How do you ensure protocol longevity for a deep-in protocol? Um, so I'll, I'll give the, the, the storage perspective. So um, what we did was we sort of, when we entered the market, we looked for the biggest ecosystem with the greatest amount of usage in the world. And that happened to be the standard set by Amazon, the S3 standard. And so what we thought we could do is adopt that standard and immediately tap into that ecosystem. But we have a whole Web3 uh, set of protocols as well. And what we're finding is that the long-term view here is that it will take enterprise three to five years to really adopt Web2 interfaces on Web3 tech. But over time, what they'll find is those Web3 protocols are actually more efficient. They are faster. And so to build that vision for the long time, I think we'll see immediate adoption of things that are just you know point and click, three lines of code, it works with their kit, and then they'll explore more. And we are seeing Web2 customers adopting the Web3 backend today. But I think it's a really, it's compatibility first and then superiority second. But I don't know, I'll pass it along for other thoughts. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. I, I guess ultimately you need to have sufficient demand at scale, right? But um, to sustain that, I, I believe you need to be decentralized in every key dimension. That means decentralized supply, so you have enough resilience, enough diversity, avoid the single points of failure. Uh, people may come and go, you make sure that quality of service stays as good as you expect. Your governance is truly decentralized. People feel represented. They have a say. They'll stay involved. They're more likely to speak up than exit. Um, and then on the demand side, you, you need to have that decentralized too. That doesn't mean the demand side themselves are uh, decentralized, but it means you have a huge diversity of demand sources. So ideally at scale, you have hundreds of different businesses all around the world. They're talking to their customers. They're tapping into their distribution channels, and they're sending demand back. And I think that creates a really unique 
and uh, amazing ecosystem. I think that's the vision. We're not there yet, but I think that's where we become truly sustainable in the long term. It's supply and demand. So it's one step in front of the other. And uh, if supply outgrows demand, it gets destroyed. If demand outgrows supply, it gets destroyed. So step by step. All right. Any other questions? Any takers? No? All right. I got a question. This is a very theoretical scenario. But if assume one day a new deep DeepIn project comes online, it's a direct competitor to your protocol, and they basically are going to vampire attack your protocol. They're saying, hey, we're going to incentivize everybody that's supplying some resource to your network, and we're just going to give out a completely ridiculous amount of our token supply, and it's going to pay your suppliers so much more than whatever you are paying your suppliers. How would you react to that? So I would say that if you build a good deep in protocol, that would mean that there's no reason for your uh, network participants to stop participating in your network, they would just also run that other network now, right? Like, your network was making the money, why would they stop making money with you unless there's like some sort of supply on like, I don't know, like if you use a lot of GPUs or something and now you need to like repurpose those. I think um, my first thought is show me a successful vampire attack <laughs> that's sustainable. Right, so my only advice would be don't die while they are doing this, and you should be okay. I think I, my answer is very similar. Value proposition, is your value proposition just money? Then great, your entire VC, uh, you know, all your angels are gonna be very angry at you when they see that tweet that you're just throwing money at people and building nothing, right? And what you've also described is a very similar scenario to what we see with airdrop farmers doing. They jump from ecosystem to ecosystem, gather all that they can, and never look at it again. Now, for an airdrop farmer, amazing, you'll make money. But for me as a protocol or as an infra, what do I get? Absolutely nothing, right? You just took my funding, you just took everything that I could have given to an engineer to scale up, and you just, you know, looted me. So I would say, come on, bring it up, you know? While you do that, I'm gonna be very excited to see how you scale, and probably that will be a good case study for me to learn from if you actually scale. So that's what I'd say, yeah. I think there's, there's two things. We've been through it twice, right? So like, I, I can tell you exactly what happened. First one was uh, we have a very loyal community, and we have demand, right? And so demand also draws, to a certain extent, drive loyalty, right? If, you're, if they're earning money on your protocol from organic demand, that's great. A vampire attack, it's going to be a, a quick, high quick start, low follow through. Because you know what the hard part is? Demand. So your moat is demand. Your moat is that loyalty of your community. They can run the other protocol. Absolutely, right? They'll earn that other token and grind that other thing out of business. And we've seen it twice. It happened twice. And uh, really, as long as you can keep the demand curve going and you can keep that supply and demand balanced, no vampire attack is going to disrupt you. Yeah, I guess I kind of think bring it on, right? Um, if people want a vampire attack, it means that you're big enough and important enough that they want to spend and potentially ruin their project uh, giving out so many tokens to try and attack you. Um, it's a great opportunity to talk about your values or culture, what you stand for. But really, defaults are really hard to move. Like, integrations are sticky. So once people are using you, they're enjoying their, uh, the product, um, they have happy customers, it's going to be pretty hard for them to move. And on the supply side, of course, the supply side will move to more opportunities, but they often have capital stakes in a network. And as John said, if they're earning enough money, they're gonna stay around. But like things will move at the edges, but yeah, honestly, I'd, I'd love to see more of that. I think uh, there's a time and place for vampire attacks. You have uh, pseudo-anonymous founders launching tokens that are just exact replica of a smart contract. And what Sushi did to Uniswap, I think it was successful in terms of his vampire attack. But I think the equation is now switched to airdrops to bring token communities together. And I think that's a more of a positive reinforcement. So tier stakers getting tokens, uh, for example. So I think that's a positive way of getting exposure to your, uh, to your like token holders with another community. And it brings the communities together. So I think that's a positive thing. But vampire attacks, uh, I don't think there's any other case that, uh, like I would say Sushi was successful for about six months. But beyond that, 
yeah, the liquidity went move back to it, uh, Uniswap. Yeah, we'll definitely agree there. All right, I think we got time for one last question. Any takers to close us out? How can uh, Deepin projects bring in government or federal uh, funding? Because they are public infrastructure, right? Sorry, what was the question? How can uh, Deepin projects bring in public funding? Government funding. Like public funding as in funding from the public or public goods funding as in funding public goods? Funding from the government. I think there's lots of ways to get funding from the government, right? If you're a Canadian company, uh, Canadian, the Canadian government has something called uh, R&D uh, credits. So every dollar that you spend on R&D uh, up to, I think, 35 cents is a rebate that the government gives it uh, to fund R&D. Um, I think that's indirectly how governments could uh, fund uh, public infrastructure like this. Government spends an enormous amount of money with Google, Amazon, and Microsoft. It's only a matter of time before that money gets spent directly with deep end projects. Today we see it indirectly, so we see a lot of universities who are getting grants and then developing applications on top of deep end. So we have, um, we have customers in the UK at uh, University of Edinburgh, Durham, Leicester, Cambridge, right, using our services today. It's incredible. But that is ultimately money that comes from the UK government through the UKRI, through the STFC, all the way down to the universities. And so it is happening. They just have to provide that service that they need. And any cloud service money that they would spend, there's no reason why they can't spend it with us. All right. I got one last fun question, just because this gets memed a lot. Should Uber be a decentralized network? If you would vote yes, put your hand up. If you would vote no, leave your hand down. OK, 50-50. All right, guys, thank you so much for joining us for today's Deep In panel. We hope you had a good time and learned a lot. Until next time. <laughs>